Just real quick, a uh, brief program introduction for any of you that might be new to the Alaska Apex Accelerator Program. And really, if you're familiar, the newest thing is the name change, which we got to launch on September 15th. And including with that name change, just a heads up, uh, the National Apex Accelerator Day is October 12th this year. And you can check out the website, the aptac-us.org, that's our association. They have several great uh, webinars that are going to be launched that day regarding the PTAC program, now the Apex Accelerator program. So if you have time, check that out. One of the things I do want to call out, although we have a name change, our program is still robustly the same, if not expanded. We still provide free one-on-one -on -one assistance with all aspects of government contracting. Uh, the nice thing is that we have a new website for the Department of Defense, Office of Small Business Programs, apexaccelerators-us forward slash pound hashtag. You can tell I just aged myself by calling it a pound symbol instead of a hashtag. But uh, feel free to check that out. And the reason I call out both the association and our DOD website is if you have offices in states other than in Alaska or you're thinking about diversifying your business or expanding that geographic region, I'd like to encourage everyone to reach out to the PTAX Apex Accelerators that are in these states. And to find those locations, you can hit either one of these two web links and um, both of them have a map on that homepage, that landing page, and you can just click on the state and you can see a listing of all of these different PTAC organizations. I think we're up to 96 now uh, across the US, Puerto Rico and Guam. So it's great to check that out. So as all of our programs, we do focus on and specialize in federal contracting, but each one of us is then an expert in our own backyard. So if you're looking at doing contracts with the state of Alaska, then absolutely talk to the Alaska Apex Accelerator. But if you're looking to do business in Hawaii or Washington State, you really do want to check out those Apex Accelerators, PTAX. Um, because each one of us have contacts and events in our own backyard, that's kind of specific to that geographic region. All right, so let's get started. Here's what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to talk about busting myths and excuses pertaining to government contracting, learning that new language, preparing for federal contracts, finding solicitations, and pursuing what to do next and some helpful resources. So busting myths and excuses. Now I've been with this program for 14 years. January, I'll start my 15th year here. And I hear some crazy, assumptions about the world of government contracting. And I've kind of picked a, a few of the top to discuss here if we're talking about busting myths and excuses as to not get involved in government contracting. So the biggest one is you're gonna get rich selling stuff to the government because you know you can market prices because well, you know, it's government and everybody's heard stories about the you know underwater toilets and screwdrivers for space. And I think I might have even switched that. But there's all kinds of stories and there's this assumption that you can just do whatever you would normally do and then just ante up the price and voila, government contracting. So one of the reasons I like to bring this up is government contracting is incredibly competitive by nature of how the federal government can spend funds for procurement activity because that is based on tax dollars. That's the the majority of where those funds are coming from, there's a certain level of transparency and responsibility of getting the most out of those funds spent. So we have what's called that um, rule of two for competition, where contracting officers have to have competition at a minimum. They have to have at least two responses to be competitive to ensure that they are getting the best value for that solicitation activity. And so it does inherently make government contracting very competitive, price competitive. And we'll talk more about what that means for you as you are getting into the government contracting arena. 
but that concept of and back in gosh when was that 2009 2010 there was a bunch of the business to government uh free workshops up here in alaska and they're like get rich sell to the government and people have made millions it is a very lucrative opportunity and there is a tremendous amount of potential for success having government contracting having government as a client and getting into that contracting arena but that it's going to be easy quick get rich quick it is a competitive arena uh, government will pay people to help find stuff they can't find that is a challenge also um, and it's one that <clears throat> i ran into quite a bit and i still hear where they're you know that finder's fee the government can't find stuff they'll pay me and i'll go match make them with different programs or businesses and not necessarily so when we are talking about when does government subcontract for goods or services or contract and then of course the contractor subcontract but when they're out there looking for those things, the agencies have processes in play to help tag the industry saying, hey, we have needs, we have, <clears throat> we need information from industry. They have the source of thought, requests for information, and there's processes in play to, for the government to be able to find that. And a lot of these positions that people feel that they can do and will have for government contracting, those positions, <coughs> excuse me, are considered inherently governmental. And it's up to the government agency uh, and to the buyers, to the program side, to do the due diligence, to do the market research, to find that information. And there really isn't that opportunity for that middleman position. All right. And we can talk more about that later. Uh, the next one, government takes forever to pay. Uh, the government may take forever to pay, but often because there's other, what do they call that? Owner errors, input errors, user errors, where small businesses um, may have issues with using the payment platforms, uh, the electronic processes to submit invoices, or they allow their SAM profiles to expire things that happen that stop that payment processing. When you talk about in a tight economy, um, in a competitive economy, where there's only so many uh, spenders versus the number of people selling, the federal government is always going to pay. They're always a very viable, um, I have worked with both agencies and businesses where the invoices are you know, over five years old, and they're still working to try to get things resolved. So the government may take a long time to pay, but usually, again, that's a user issue. Um, something didn't happen, something wasn't completed. But the federal government will always pay for those contract opportunities. Uh, too much red tape, too many pages, too hard, uh, finding stuff. And to that last excuse, that one's not so much a myth as an excuse of not getting in government contracting. Uh, I point out to the reason why, one, you guys are here today. There's a lot of resources available to assist you in learning that government contract. And of course, the Apex Accelerator programs are is exactly what we're here to do, is to help you understand that contracting process uh, and get through, be comfortable with the solicitation process and start to understand the language in that legal realm in which we're entering into government contracting. So although it can be very daunting at first, the more you work with it, especially when you have that assistance, you can start to see a lot of repetitive activities, such as boilerplate clauses that are in every purchase activity. Uh, and you start to be comfortable within that realm and it does become doable, but it is different. It is a lot of language and uh, new processes to learn when you get involved in government contracting. But fortunately, there's that free assistance, Apex Accelerators. All right, so here's another one myth that often you're gonna be told by competitors, is you have to be in business for more than two years before you can go after government contracts. 
Well, not necessarily. It really depends on what you have for experience. So, and so again, either be in business for two years or you have to have past experience in government contracts to get government contracts. They all kind of go hand in hand. And this is where we're going to talk about experience versus past performance. So no, the only requirement in the realm of government contracting where you have to have been in business at least two years is if you are going after the 8A uh, business development program uh, certification through SBA. And that's one of the few things that has a minimum two year requirement. For every other opportunity for government contracting, it's really more about experience in past performance. So when the agency is under that realm of best value, we kind of talked about that in that competitive realm, they're looking for past ex performance, past experience, what has your company performed, or what can you show that your key personnel, your business owner, um, provided personal experience that you're bringing to the table. So never let someone tell you that you cannot. Um, and if you ever have questions about this or being pushed into that. You need government contracts to be able to get government contracts. Uh, feel free to reach out and we can talk about that more specific to your business. Keep in mind that any projects, whether commercial, residential, that your business has completed can be considered past performance for a federal solicitation. So if we're talking janitorial services or construction or snow plowing, your the activity is pretty much the same process, whether you're, you're plowing for a bank or plowing for a federal building. Um, the difference really is that contractual, that administrative process of getting those contracts and building those relationships to begin with. But the work itself is pretty standard across whoever the owner is. So a lot of people forget that, that they're non-government activity also counts as past performance. The value of having the government contract and being able to say that for past performance is an indicator that you are familiar with the contract compliance requirements and have experiences in that as well as performing those scopes of work. All right, next myth. I have to have all my certifications before bidding on government contracts. And we see this one a lot is the run through, and we'll talk about what I'm referring to for government certifications here in just a few slides, but that I have to have everything that I qualify. And then once that's in place, I can start then bidding on projects. Well, really the only thing that you need to complete is that system for award management, again, coming up in a few slides, uh, before you are eligible to start bidding on government contracts. But often if you wait to get all of these different certifications in place, you've lost a year of potential opportunity to be able to bid on current solicitation opportunities. So keep this in mind. Government contracting has a very secular process. Um, everything runs in cycles. And the contracts can be either a one year or even up to five years, six months, which is the uh, cap on contract duration. Um, of course, there's exceptions for utilities and leases, et cetera. But you can have these multi-year contracts where you have a base year and then anywhere from two to four option years. So if this opportunity for, let's just use janitorial again, and it's gonna be a five-year contract, comes around but you don't go after it because you're focusing on certifications, even if you don't need a certification for that particular activity, maybe it's not a set aside that requires certification for, um, you're gonna have to wait for that contract to complete that duration before it comes up for bid again. And so it's a lot of lost opportunity. Certifications are really about that icing on the cake. They our marketing value. Uh, their biggest area for the small business certifications is when it comes to government contracting set-asides. And that means where competition has been restricted to those businesses that have been certified for those subcategories of small business. 
And we'll talk more about that here again as well. But this is not necessarily something that you have to have in place before you can start building those business relationships uh, and looking for government contracting opportunities. And here, another myth, because I am a native owned, women owned, veteran owned, um, they have to give me a contract. Uh, agencies will pick me because of my small business certifications. So this is not necessarily the case. And there's a lot of assumption that based on those small business designations that you are a shoe in for a federal contract. So there's a little bit of confusion on language. So when we talk about preference, so the state of Alaska has bidder's preference. If you're looking at um, authorities for the kind of that pseudo government, such as uh, Cook Inlet Housing Authority, you'll see language where they give preference to native owned businesses. So preferences is a weighted process for determining award. So in the federal arena, there really isn't a preference process. Um, there is one exception. Uh, I'm not gonna go in that now. We'll talk about that later. But in federal government, when the contracting officer receives that procurement request, that PR, they're looking at the methodology that they're going to use to go forward and announce the solicitation. So they are going to then predetermine, is it going to be a small business set aside, if it's under that dollar threshold uh, for that simplified acquisition procedure, the SAP, uh, then it's going to be presumed to be set aside for small business. And what that means is based on the NAICS code assigned to that associate, that solicitation activity, if you, the business, are under that size standard for that NAICS code, then you are a small business for the purpose of bidding on that solicitation. But there are the subcategories as well. So the contracting officers to help meet their small business goals can predetermine that they're going to set aside for, say, HUBZone, which is another small business certification, and because they are pre-filtering that at the beginning and making that a part of the requirement for that solicitation, then preferences no longer are even applicable uh, because the determination has already been made that it's going to be set aside. So there's no additional reason as to why, because you have these certifications, that you would be a shoe in for a government contract. Now, when we're talking about full and open, a uh, non-restrictive competition where there is no set aside uh, and often there are very large contracts and we see that, you know, most often there's going to be large businesses going after these contracts, they do have requirements for small business subcontracting plans. And those plans need to mirror in intent for the federal government contracting for, you know, bringing in those small businesses and having a percentage of that cost factor of that contract be subcontracted to small businesses. In that case, this is where those small business certifications have that additional marketing value to those prime contractors that are trying to meet that goal, uh, trying to hit and develop those small business subcontracts. And that's where, in addition to being good at what you do, those small business certifications can have that additional value. And the last one is here, 8A certification will guarantee me contracts. So 8A is that SBA's business development uh, certification. And the one true highlighted value of that 8A program is within that first three years, that opportunity for directed sole source contracts. And by that term sole source, it means it bypasses the requirement for competition. Um, they're directed awards. You can build that relationship with the contracting agency. They can award directly to you through SBA, uh, with SBA approval. It's part of that 8A program as well. Uh, and you have that opportunity to gain that award without going through a competitive action. But that is a unique cer uh, circumstance under this business development program where the agencies uh, 
are using that contracting mechanism as a vehicle to help develop small businesses and give them that opportunity for growth. Again, it's a business development uh, program. But just because you have that certification doesn't mean contracts are gonna be laid at your feet. There's still that business development process. And we're gonna, I'm working with SBA, uh, we're going to uh, start getting that uh, reoccurring 8A orientation webinars going. So stay tuned for more information on that. But these are the basic myths and excuses for government contracting. There's a lot of confusion. So let's move forward and talk about the difference between commercial versus federal. And if you're new to the government contracting arena, these are some of the little hurdles that can kind of trip you up in understanding that process. So let's talk about this first one, making the sale. Who makes the decisions and who has the buying power? So when it comes down to your business development, your marketing individuals, your, your um, direct sales people, often they're going out, they're building those business relationships, they're meeting with these potential clients, they're promoting their business, they're talking about how they can meet the needs, um, provide the goods or services that this individual needs to support that day-to-day -day activity. Well, that concept is really no different between the commercial world and the contracting arena. And the difference is understanding authority and who has the decision to say, yep, you guys are exactly what we need. We want to do business with you. And how are you going to get paid? So that's the biggest difference right there between commercial and federal. All right, so we have a, think of it as a teeter-totter, that kind of equation in the contracting realm that we have the program folks, and I'm gonna oversimplify this, so bear with me for my language, but we have the program folks and then we have the contracting staff. And even though it's the program side of it, the end user, um, the individuals that run their program under that agency that have the need or defining, how they're going to spend their budget, uh, they are not necessarily the ones that have the warrant authority to commit the federal government in paying you for completing or providing whatever it is that um, your company is selling. So let's have an example. So painting companies, we have, uh, you know, going around or even roofing companies, roofing's fast on my mind today. Uh, but uh, we can go door to door, they can, salesmen can come up to me as a homeowner and talk to me about the potential of repainting my home, uh, re-roofing my house, and we can have that conversation. And then I can say, yes, absolutely. And I have the authority as the owner to commit my funds into having that work completed. And then we can begin the negotiation of, am I paying up front? Um, is it a written contract? I'm, quotes provided, and we move into the contractual process of that exchange, you know, that financial for completion of whatever it is that I'm wanting to buy. In the contracting realm, again, we have the program side of the house where unless they can do something on a purchase card under that microprocess or micro purchasing threshold, uh, there again can find and determine what they want to do but they have to create a purchase request and then it goes over to the contracting officers who have the authority to then decide how that need is going to be met. And thus it goes into that competitive contract activity, uh, the market researches and solicitations are issued. So understanding that even though you were building relationships with the agencies, even if they're a five-star general, or a base commander, they are not necessarily the ones with the warranted authority to be able to commit the federal government to giving you funds for those goods and services. Um, that area can really cost businesses that are unaware of that process a lot of money. Uh, one example is 
there was a base program and I was working with a company and this was quite a few years ago and they gave him the green light to do fireworks and it was a sizable amount for a very specific program and he ordered and delivered and then he went to invoice and everybody's like well we don't know what you're talking about you don't have a contract and we had to go back and work with the agency and then bring in contracting to get all of that um, ratified to after the fact because the individuals even though they gave the go ahead and they had that apparent authority of saying yes we're buying this get that done um, we need it by this and this date they didn't have the warrant authority to guarantee that that individual was going to be paid and in that case there is a potential of losing out on those funds again contracting worked with that business and they were able to get all of that resolved after the fact and that individual was paid for that because it was ordered there was assumptions made on both parties um, and he almost lost out on that sizable fund uh, and had inventory back in stock so keep in mind that when you're talking about that for the commercial and you're building those business relationships you know often those different levels of management are given authority by the company by the business owners to be able to commit that company up to certain dollar sizes the larger the dollar size the further up that hierarchy chain in the government contracting realm that changes with that the uh, it has to be a warranted officer to be able to enter into any sort of contractual application or contract for on behalf of the federal government all right so handshake deals quotes proposals i kind of talked about all of this um one last thing i want to talk about is even though you might be working with someone in the federal government and they ask you to provide a quote uh, it's more for informational purposes uh, federal government is not going to sign a quote in your format uh, with your terms and conditions instead they're going to use that as a supporting document for maybe cost consideration when they're doing budgeting uh, part of the difference between commercial and federal is that legal realm you know who signs what when submitting quotes and proposals uh, in what legal structure are we working under for that contractual activity so when you look at the FAR, uh, the contracting, the federal acquisition regulations, and that is the body of law that's part of it, um, there's other factors as well, that is going to provide the structure under which contracts are completed, issued, completed, paid, closed out, et cetera. So when you provide a quote to a commercial, or you know, if you're at my front door, and I, yes, I want you to uh, replace my roof, and I sign that, that begins that legal issues. If there's an issue with it, you know, what is, is there a language in that quote that I've signed, turning it into a contract that states, how do I resolve that? Versus the federal arena, we're looking at those contracts where that solicitation that you bid on becomes the basis of your contract, and it has the, how do you resolve? Uh, the contract dispute, the changes clause, uh, payment terms and conditions, all of those different things are in that solicitation package. So when that contract's awarded, it gives you how do you handle these questions. So uh, long story short, taking a lot of time on this particular, the, the biggest difference between that commercial and federal is who has the authority to guarantee that you're going to get paid for the work that you are doing. And we can talk more about this, um, lots of stories, but uh, let's go ahead for sake of time and keep going. Questions on any of this? All right, so preparing for contracts. So I'm gonna kind of whip through these next few slides to get myself uh, back on my timetable. So one of the things that I sit down with a business and we're talking about government contracting for the first time, it's really about, do you know your business capacity? Because you've already mentioned, it's a very competitive realm that we're entering into. And the most competitive factor is usually that price component. And I all have people all the time, well, how much profit can I make? How much should I bid? And it comes down to, well, how much does it cost you to run your business? What is your break-even point? 
And so when you're looking at going after these potential contracts, these are some of the base factors that you really want to think about before you start pulling that together. So when we talk about your business capacity, uh, let's first talk about that operational capacity ceiling. So if you're in the construction arena, uh, what's your bonding capacity? And that's that surety bonding, that bid bond, payment bond, performance bond. What's the maximum? What's your available now if you have an aggregate of you know one million, but you have two contracts out that are five hundred thousand, you've kind of already bumped up against the ceiling, and here's your bottleneck before you're able to accept further work um, because you've run up against that capacity for your bonding. Uh, what do you have for work in progress? How what's your staff load now? Uh, if you're going after another contract and you're looking at that potential, uh, do you have the manpower, the equipment, the finances? in place and available to be able to commit to other factors to commit to doing and finding another contract or putting that bid in for that opportunity for that contract. So looking at these things like work in progress, uh, contingency planning resources, staff training and certifications, um, government contracting specific accounting practices, uh, the higher the dollar threshold, the more things come into play for accounting, certified accounting systems, uh, things along those lines. And, and really this is, is your business ready for government contracting? Whether you're a new business or have an existing business and you're rolling into government contracts, uh, even if you're looking at expanding into the commercial arena, knowing what your business capacity is at, where your stress loads are, where your bottlenecks are, and if your business can take on more, and looking not just at the financial aspect of it, but your labor uh, supplies, all of those factors as well, and knowing where you're at is going to help guarantee your success in that contracting arena. Continuing on that, that area of preparing for contracts, um, specifically talking to pricing factors, and I've kind of already mentioned this, that you know, what is your break-even point? Because if we're talking about a competitive arena, the only area in which you can truly compete is those contingency costs that you build into the, your cost factors and your profit. Because obviously, you don't want to bid or to play that comp competition game to the point where you have won an award that is guaranteeing you a loss of income. Um, we see that sometimes when things get really tight or the years where there's lesser government spending. Um, we kind of went through that a few years ago when Jay Bear had caught up on a lot of their big construction projects and there was a lull in some of the bigger construction activity, you know, here at Ellendorf Richardson. And uh, also about the same time, our, you know, residential housing market had kind of crashed for building new homes. And so there was a lot more construction companies looking at a smaller potential job pool and things got very tight. So people were bidding less and less. And it's understanding at what point is com com competition good? At what point are you now losing money and you need to back away? Um, invariably, you'll see someone come in and lowball a bid because they're trying to get their foot in the door or maybe they didn't understand that solicitation activity as well, uh, and, and they'll come in and underbid that contract activity. If you are playing that game without really understanding your breaking points, your cash flow, how's that going to impact your business, and are you putting your danger, your business in danger of a significant loss, or is the potential gain of operating at a loss for this one activity worth what you are hoping to get out of for the long run? So in that case with the construction activity, we saw some of the bigger companies bidding on smaller contracts just because they were looking at some sort of break even to keep their labor in place. Um, they didn't want to lose their staff or lay off their staff and were willing to take that hit elsewhere. But if you don't understand your business costs and expenses, then how competitive are you truly being and how far into that um, losing proposition are you putting yourself? Also, we have government registrations in that preparing for contracts. So the one thing I mentioned when we were talking about certifications is to be ready to be contract eligible, 
is you do have to have your entity registration in SAM, that system for award management. And of course, that feeds into that dynamic small business search, which gives you that additional marketing value. And of course, those applicable small business certification programs, which are critical if you're looking at trying to bid on a set-aside opportunity. So let's talk more about SAM. So SAM, that system entity, it is providing the agency all of the information that they need to be able to create a vendor payment profile so that when you are awarded a contract, your payment data is already in place. You have the identification of your business, the NAICS codes, the PSC codes. Having the NAICS codes, one identifies your industry, but it also has those associated size standards. So when it comes to set aside, you are certifying that yes, you are a small business based on those NAICS codes. It also has the representation and certifications that is required before government can enter into a contract with you. Uh, and you are certifying whether you have been debarred from federal contracting, um, if you've been uh, investigated by other civil agencies, if you have back taxes, um, there's other factors again to be that contract eligible and to be a responsive bidder. So your SAM registration kind of pre-does all of that so that you are then contract ready. It also provides a lot of marketing information in general um, because a completed SAM profile fills into that di SBA's dynamic small business search. It provides keywords, capability narratives, so that when agencies are doing that market research, uh, your information is there to be found. So at a minimum, your SAM profile is setting that flag of, yes, I am definitely interested in government contract for both the agencies and those prime contractors that are looking for potential vendors. So minimum requirement SAM absolutely has to be in place before a contract can be executed, or if you have an existing contract, it has to remain active before additional funds can be paid to you. Uh, dynamic small business search is that uh, pre-filter where agencies are searching, and of course it takes all of the SAM data and it returns only the results that are small businesses. It filters out all of the large businesses, organizations, other governmental entities, et cetera. Small business certifications. So we've already kind of addressed that as in, sometimes they're not as critical as you think you are, but let's talk about specifically what are they? So, and this is really pertinent to the federal arena. These certifications here aren't necessarily applicable if we're talking about state of Alaska contracting. And um, this is again, specifically for federal. So let's talk about the SBA issued certifications. The, the first one is that 8A business development program. And I've kind of already talked about that. So I'm not gonna spend as much time on it um, just cause we're running down and still have quite a ways to go. Uh, but it's a nine-year business development program. Uh, there is an application process and eligibility requirements. Uh, in the, on the PTAC website under the on-demand, I do have a recording for a small business certification overview that I've done where I've talked about each one of these, talked about the eligibility, the application process, and that is available for you if you want to go into more detail now. Um, but I don't have as much time for that. And there's other factors I wanna focus on. But uh, HubZone is based on location that historically underutilized business zone. It's where your principal office must be in a designated uh, HubZone region. And of course, 35% of your employees also have to be. So this one is really more um, based on physical location than socioeconomic factors. Uh, we have the women-owned and economically disadvantaged women-owned small business, and we have the veteran and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses as well. And this certification is new to the SBA parameters that kicked in as of January of this year, uh, but it's been a probably SBA's best application process and quickest as well. 
I just wanted to note that SBA still has in place uh, third party approved third party certifiers for the women owned and small business uh, economically disadvantaged women owned small business certifications. You even if you pay a third party provider, um, there's value for you in the commercial word world uh, under supplier diversity programs to have these certifications. Um, but even if you go through this process with a third party supplier, you still have to go through and do the application to be contract eligible for the woman owned small business certifications or for set asides. Excuse me, I misspoke. All right. So those are SBA certifications, but you can also self certify when you are completing your SAM profile as well. So this is another factor that the government needs to gather that data as part of that contract eligibility uh, for those for the federal agency to be able to reach their small business goals, they have to be able to identify which con uh, business owners in which they're entering into contracts, what are those socioeconomic designations. So this is just a screenshot from SAM where I've kind of expanded everything so you can see that. Um, but you can self-certify here on this top level as that veteran owned, and then as it expands, you can see all of these, but you can certify um, as a small business based on your NAICS code and that associated size standard. So you're going to be entering your gross receipts and that average number of employees that will allow the system to determine if you're a small business for each of those NAICS codes that you've entered. And then here under the socio socioeconomic category on the general information page is where you can select and self-certify that you are minority woman or veteran owned business. We also have the State of Alaska Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. Um, each state has an approved program that they're uh, working with under uh, Federal Highway Administration, FWHA, Federal, um, sorry, I'm blanking on that full, but it's under the Department of Transportation. Uh, this is one where that is a state certification that is geared toward state contracting more than federal, um, but if you do have that certification, uh, there is a question in your SAM profile where it asks if you've been certified by a state certifying DBE program. And if you're interested and have more questions about this particular, uh, we do have a, a DBE orientation certified for the 24th of this month. And just for your information, for more uh, commercial certifications, uh, not necessarily that you're going to see eligible that's going to directly impact the government contracting world. Um, there are not set asides necessarily under these supplier diversity programs, but there are certifying entities and national uh, programs, national um, professional, oh, I'm blanking on the words, uh, networking programs with so, for example, let, let me stop trying to explain it in general. Um, any of these programs have monthly meetings, kind of like our chambers. Uh, they have networking events. They have assistance programs. They have matchmaking events. Uh, so there's membership that you can purchase for these professional organizations, uh, like AGCs, like um, CFMA, which we'll talk about here shortly. But there's that opportunity. But each one of these different organizations also does certification for these subcategories for supplier diversity programs. All right, so let's talk about how is all of this linked. When we're talking about getting involved in federal contracting, and I've kind of talked about the contracting cycles, um, there's a lot of information available out there well, we can do research. But if we're looking at, should I get involved in the government contracting market? I'm gonna swap screens. Let's talk about, um, we first really need to do the market research of, does the government buy what my business is offering? Um, and if they do, in what quantity, where are the buyers? What is the frequency? How do I find out, is this something that I should be looking at? So see, even if you're established here in Alaska, but you're looking at expanding down into Washington State, 
and you want to know, well, who's the buyers? How am I going to find out? Um, should I do the expansion in that government contracting arena? Who's there and what's in place? We do have these federal databases. So back to this, how it's all linked when we're doing our market research. So we talked about SAM.gov as being that entity registration, but it is also the main place where opportunities are posted. So under the component of contract opportunities under the SAM.gov or within that SAM website, we can find those posted solicitations. So the FAR requires that if a federal agency is posting a solicitation, a, you know, a contract activity, then it's over that $25,000 threshold. Um, they ha it has to be posted here in SAM under the contract opportunities even if the posting directs the reader to another site such as FedConnect. Um, there are other federal agencies or other federal posting websites where solicitations can be housed. Uh, we have Army Acquisition, Fed, uh, FedConnect also has a lot of reverse engineering, or I'm sorry, reverse auction, <laughs> not reverse engineering, reverse auction websites. So there's other places where solicitations can be posted but the listing has to be, it's a shell requirement. If it's over that 25,000 and it's gonna be posted, it has to be listed in the SAM website. All right, so we talked about that for looking up information. So if we are talking about, should I get involved in government contracting, here's all of the different databases that we can look at. So SAM gives us a great snapshot of what's going on here now. Well, we've just entered a new fiscal year, and if any of you were following the news, we were looking at that potential of a government shutdown. And currently, uh, now that we're in that new fiscal year, they're operating under that continuing resolution until November 17th, sometime mid-November. Uh, but obviously the federal government hasn't been fully funded for the next operating year. But we can follow and look up the spending history we can look at agency websites for agency budgets. Here, I would say by mid-November, we should have all of the agency forecasts for the current fiscal year. So we can see what is the agency planning to buy? Um, what have they budgeted? Should our, they get their final federal budget approved and those funds roll down? How are they spending those funds? What contracting activities do they have planned for this budget year? We can find that information under the agency forecast. We can go to the agency website and even down to the regional website for that agency to find out, well, what hot topics is that agency focusing on? What are they looking at for? What are they talking about? What are they highlighting? Uh, what language are they using? So we have these databases and these websites that we can do research to see is the government contracting potential worth the level of effort in that learning curve for you to enter into? We can do that market research. We have USA spending where we can see where those federal funds are flowing from government into the state. So even if you are thinking, um, you know, you are more of a supply, a supporting business, you might not necessarily be the one looking for contracts directly, but you would be supporting a lot of the prime contractors going after these bids, then we can still see, well, where are those funds rolling into? And of course, federal procurement data system, um, I just completed a webinar on that about a week or so ago, um, and that webinar has been posted to our website. But this is the database where I can find all that past procurement activity, so I can see what has the government bought previously. I can look in SAM to get a snapshot of what's coming on for the immediate some good looking backwards at inactive solicitations, but the contract award data is gonna be found here in FPDF. And of course, if you're looking at the GSA um, multiple award schedules, um, they have the GSA query, schedule query database, where you can see, again, how much has the federal government spent under those GSA schedules. A Lot of information there. So knowing that there is all these websites, we really can talk about, well, what is it that we need to find out to make that determination if government contracting is something I want to get more involved in? Um, we start by asking ourselves, well, what questions do we need answers to? And then finding the right database 
and start doing the research. One of the things that, you know, when I sit down with a client for the first time and we're talking about getting involved in government contracting is it's, I ask, well, who are your commercial clients now? And what that gives me is, you know, what is the governmental counterpoint for those commercial activities, those commercial industries, that we can take your experience in your business past performance in that commercial realm and now apply it to that government contracting side of it. So again, construction is a great one. Janitorial, if you know you might be doing all the commercial residential, absolutely. Um, government has facilities as well. They need the janitorial services, um, same as any commercial client. So just as an example. Um, and we kind of talked about, you know, frequency, who's buying, what, where are the contracting officers that should you pursue it as a prime or is your opportunity better as a subcontractor? Um, all of that information can be found in these different databases that we've talked about. So just a quick uh, screenshot for SAM and that contract opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of filter opportunity, way to filter get into SAM and looking for these, uh, these potential contracts for us. Of course, the screenshot um, is from January, but it still gives you that information. Uh, if you're looking for additional information on how to do the research itself, again, I happen to have a great recording posted on our website on uh, doing government marketing. And also, this is something that I am more than happy to schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with you where we can look at doing the market research and how to do the market research specific to your business as opposed into um, me discussing this now in an introductory you know, introduction to government contracting webinar. Uh, FPDS, again, that past procurement activity, you can start with a NAICS code or a keyword and search. Um, and there's a lot of great data you can pull. And this is, I, I can't, this is an incredibly powerful uh, website for looking for those activity on specific contract histories, but as well as what agencies are buying. So if we just did a NAICS search and a janitorial, and then we filtered that down to place performance, we could see which agencies have actually issued contracts for janitorial services in the last five years here in the state of Alaska. Um, it might give us information, so where is the contract cycles at? Uh, when are those contracts going to end and come up for bid again? That type of information is available. It's here for the searching. I mentioned USA Spending. I like this website simply because it gives us an idea of how much money is moving through the state. So when I talk about should you look at government contracting, well, here's the dollars. I just updated this number this morning for uh, federal funds coming into the state of Alaska for fiscal year 2023, we're over 14 billion, 629 million. Uh, for contracts, you can see contracts, uh, grants, direct payments, loans, et cetera, that have been issued through the state of Alaska. Ignore that, that's an older screenshot, but I just went in through here and uh, was able to search by location and was able then to see the funds. And of course, you can see all of the contract activity as well. So if we're looking at following the funds for that potential for contracting uh, opportunity for you, one thing that USA Spending shows is it also shows the grant monies moving in through the state. So we can see where the state of Alaska Department of Transportation has received federal DOT funds, which we know then is going to become state contract opportunities for us as well. So we can look at the grant funds and who are the grant recipients. Uh, we can see there are different tribal governments with grant funds. Um, we can even then not necessarily dig into the grant award itself, but if those monies are coming into the state, there is a spending requirement to have those funds spent before they can ask for those additional funds the following year. So there is the opportunity just by following the flow of capital through the state of where are these contracts going to be realized. So yeah, absolutely. Looking at the grants and looking at which state departments within Alaska are receiving those grants, um, like HUD, uh, housing authorities, 
Absolutely. It's a great way to kind of figure out who's going to have money to spend for potential contract actions. Um, one thing, so, you know, we're talking about looking at the potential solicitations following the flow, looking at SAM, you know, looking at our past history of contract activity and procurement, following the funds. It is a lot of information to go through. So one of the tools that we offer is BidMatch. This is our solicitation search software. It's only a forward looking for upcoming solicitation and contracting related notices such as sources sought or award notifications or special announcements. Uh, but this is something that PTAC offers for free. And you can see that I am the point of contact on that. So if this is something that you're interested in, you're always welcome to reach out to us um, and set up an appointment. And I'm happy to talk to you more about that. And you guys can probably guess it, but yep, there is a webinar on the Bid Match program as well. I just completed it last week. It's up on our website as well. Uh, the nice thing about watching that webinar is it talks about how to do market research and building good search criteria so that the software really works well for you. So again, you're welcome to reach out to um, Alaska Apex and schedule an appointment. We're really happy to work with you and get this solicitation search software established for your company. Because if you can get this tool working for you, that's one less website. Um, well, I should say the bid match covers over 250 different websites, depending on your geographic region. Um, not only does it focus on federal, but it also covers state and local contracting as well. So great information. And we offer that for our active clients for free. So really, if once you've decided, okay, government contracting really has that potential um, it is something that I might be truly interested in. How do I really get started? And it comes down to building those business relationships. And the next few slides, I kind of talk about different SBA, you know, mentor protege programs. There's the joint, vis, uh, joint venture processes. There's a teamed approach where you have that prime subcontractor relationship. But really, it's about starting to build those relationships. And then this aspect functions no differently than you building those relationships in that commercial world. You need to get to know those business decision makers, um, understand your potential client, what is it they're looking for, understand how are they purchasing, how are they going about getting those needs met. And then again, you know, learning, meeting the contracting officers, having that networking opportunity to build those relationships. So I kind of mentioned this briefly of the different professional organizations, because all of these provide you, depending on your area, your industry that you're involved in, um, there are professional associations throughout the state um, that provide opportunities to get, in, to, get to meet other businesses uh, within that arena for that potential business development. So uh, if you're in construction, there's the AGC. In fact, they have their big uh, annual conference coming up that first week in November. So it's just right around the corner and uh, check out their website. You don't have to be an AGC member to attend, but if you're engineering uh, construction, absolutely, that is an event worth checking out. A lot of great educational opportunity, but a lot of networking value as well. Uh, we have the SAMI, the Society of, Ameri of Army Military Engineers, and all of these different CFMA, NAWIC, um, SPM SPMS, all do uh, ongoing training and events. And it gives you an opportunity to meet not just your competitors, but potential teaming partners um, where you can gain that business information, build those relationships to help strengthen your business to be contract ready. So marketing plans, um, at this point in time, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. I've got just a couple of slides left, if you can just bear with me for about oh, three more minutes and we'll close this out. But under that realm of building relationships, it is about making plans to do so. So we talk about uh, business plan writing and often we will ask you, even if you're an existing biz, uh, business that's been in, in place for a while, you know, have you developed a business plan? 
And specifically in your business plan, have you identified a marketing plan? How are you going to notify the business community that your business is out there? So just living in Anchorage, how many times have we, you know, driven, doing chores, dropping kids off, running back and forth, and we say, oh, look, there's a new restaurant opening on that corner. I'll have to go check them out, and we get busy and we forget, or by the time we come looking for it, you know, the and to, that business is already closed. They never, they didn't make it. They didn't get enough clientele. That marketing, that notifying that business community the potential consumers that your business exists has value, whether you're just looking at commercial, but also keep in mind that those government employees that we need to reach out for those business relationships, those uh, program managers, those contracting officers also reside here as well. So when you're talking about marketing, that notification of your business is available and provides the following, uh, keep that in mind, and that's an important component for government contracting that I think for small businesses is often overlooked. Uh, if you're looking for a resource for assistance in developing marketing plans, I really recommend the Alaska Small Business Development Center. They've got a lot of great free and on-demand webinars on social marketing, social media campaigns, marketing. Um, I just did a webinar as well. I feel like I'm just way too much self-promotion here on you know, writing marketing emails. I had a webinar on passive and active uh, marketing tips on, and we talked about uh, just that, promoting your business to that marketing potential. So in conclusion, ooh, a lot of things to talk about. Um, are you ready for government contracting? If you are, let's get started. And how can PTAC help? Can you tell which slide I didn't update from PTAC to Alaska Apex? Uh, but again, we're here to assist you with any of these things that we brought up. If you need more information, want to talk about it specifically for your business, absolutely reach out, uh, set an appointment, and let us know how we can provide that assistance. So, you know, do the research. The data is out there and it's free. There's that a lot of information to discover to help you make that business decision of should you move forward or not. Build those relationships with that potential business partners and agencies. Uh, learn the language of the government contracting, read solicitation, ask questions. And if you need assistance understanding those solicitations, that's something that we can provide assistance with as well. Uh, register in SAM and keep your business profile active. There's been a lot of changes in the SAM registration process and it's not quick or as convenient as it used to be. Um, it's a little buggy, but again, if you need assistance, uh, Alaska Apex is here to assist you with that as well. So as I had mentioned, the Alaska Small Business Development Center, great resource for any of these things that we might have talked about. Check out their workshops, um, financing, growing your business, looking for employees, uh, marketing, absolute fantastic resource. And they're one of our partner programs here at the university under the Business Enterprise Institute. Check them out, a lot of great resources. Even if you are an existing business, um, they offer more than just business startup. So there's a lot of great, uh, great information tools on their website as well. And last but not least, I said call, set appointments. Here's how you can reach our offices. So we have an office in Anchorage and Fairbanks. And again, if you're interested in getting started in government contracting arena, Hopefully I've given you enough information to help make the decision, is this something that you want to do? Or what is it that you need to learn more about? Uh, where is that learning curve that you need to tackle to be better ready uh, to pursue those contracting activities? So if you need that assistance, absolutely we're here to help. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for hanging in there. Uh, do I have any questions? thrown a lot of information over a lot of topics. Um, again, download those handouts, keep the links for the different slides. And if you want to review any of this, uh, this webinar will be posted on our website at um, alaskaapex.org under the training events. And usually um, it'll be up there by Monday for sure. Uh, 
it's usually just a couple of day turnaround um, before that's posted to our website. Well, at this point in time, uh, if I don't have any further questions, I'm going to go ahead and close the webinar.